Lord's saying it's not another year, but part of a day. I made you in a spirit. I brought you here as a spirit. You became flesh and it was corrupted. Now the battle is not against flesh, but it's of the spirit. And he says, your spirit must choose. This time, this place, the life I gave you, again, in the spirit, is to be renewed and to grow. Many have perished this year. My saints have been persecuted, killed. My church has been devastated. But he says, my spirit is still alive. Father, breathe on them tonight. In the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. Praise God. Well, that was good. Praise God. Thank you, David. David sells insurance, by the way. I didn't have my microphone on. Um, this is a... I, we were in the spirit, and, you know, this is a battle going on right now. A lot of people don't realize it's not on the outside. Everything that's happening to our country right now has to do with a battle between God's spirit and the spirit that men choose to follow. Period. And so we're going to get into some teaching. Last week we were talking about how did, how did I connect... Remember last week I was teaching? Joseph and Hanukkah. I did. It was, I thought it was pretty good. You know, all of a sudden, here's Joseph. The battle with Joseph was between his family. And he was in the pit. And when we're in the season, you know, everybody talks about the, the spirit of the season, you know, Christmas and all the, you know, there's so many people depressed and everything because that's not the right spirit. And uh, last night I... I, I I posted on Facebook the, the, the evolution of Santa Claus. And I got a lot of positive. But, you know, we have to realize we can get two. We go from the right lane to the left lane. You know, Brother Hagen used to call it from ditch to ditch. You know, we got, we got to study something, but we don't, want, it's, we don't want to get so zealous that we're turning people off. Okay, so, so this is the time that we got to use some balance in who we are, what we're teaching, because it's about unity in the spirit. And a lot of times, it's, it's kind of like hanging around with the ex-smoker. <laughs> it got real quiet in here. <laughs> you know, and we, we were over in Korea, and uh, uh, Korea is a little bit different. They got, the, in Seoul, the sidewalks are about, you know, 30 feet across. They're real long sidewalks. So at nighttime, the, the businesses roll up will open up and there it, it souls like New York City it's 24 hours a day and so uh, Kimberly and I were sitting there and this kid came up and lit his cigarette right in my face as we were sitting there eating and I turned into Hulk I'm serious I, 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 I was about ready to snap this guy and here we are we're on a mission trip I'm about ready to beat this kid on the in the street and, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like, uh, I, I, I would have won, but it's his turf. You know what I'm saying? I would have been in jail, would have ruined the trip, and Kimberly wouldn't have married me. <laughs> nah, she did. So, you know, th this battle of the spirit is something that's going on. And, you know, it's funny because Jacob had 12 sons. Only one of them figured out what was going on. Benjamin was the baby. He didn't, he didn't get involved in that. And so here we are, you know, fast forward 4,000 years. We're still battling the same spirit. Well, let's go to uh, uh, the Parsha reading for the week. And it's in Genesis uh, 46. And on, on Christmas Day, we always eat bagels and salmon. Praise God. I, Jesus would have. And I think it might have been. We're in Genesis, and we go to 40, uh, 46. And we, this is a continuing the story. And, uh, so let's start with verse 1. And so, so Israel, they're not calling him Jacob right now. It's Israel. Okay? 
And we talked about that last week, how there was a shifting there where there was a battle where Jacob had to decide who he was going to be. And so he stepped into the role of Israel. Israel set out with all that he had and came to uh, Bathsheba and offered sacrifices to the, to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, here I am. And he said, Here I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid. Go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And, and Joseph will close your eyes. So this is a promise. This is an extenuating promise. And it keeps going back. But Beersheba was a place where Abraham brought Isaac to make the covenant. Isaac laid his life up on the altar. He wasn't a little kid. Isaac knew the covenant that he, his father had with God literally went up to the spot where he was going to be made a sacrifice. Jacob left the promised land and finally came back to the promised land and got to the point where, hey, everything's great. I got my sons and one of his sons disappeared. For 20 years he, he thought Jacob was dead. So to receive his son, oh, this is great, it's just coming out of me right now. To receive, receive his son down in Egypt, he had to go to the point where his father was going to be sacrificed. Another son was going to be given so he could receive his son. So he went and made a sacrifice at the same place that Abraham took Isaac. So it comes full circle. As he's leaving, he has to bring up the covenant. God brings the covenant back to him. God says, here I am, here I am, here I am. Let's back up a little. And we see this same situation in Genesis uh, 22. How many people are cold right now? Hot? Lukewarm will spit you out. <laughs> All right, nobody got that. Okay, funny people on this side. <laughs> Genesis 22, verse 9. And then they came to a place of which God had told them. Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar at the top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord came and called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, I am here. Here I am. Here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing against him. For I, kn I know now that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, for me. And Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him, he, uh, he, him a ram he caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering. Abraham, Abraham, here I am. I deal with a lot of people in the spirit. And tonight we're going to ask the question, are you waiting for God to communicate to you? I'm serious. How many people are here waiting for God to communicate to you? Here I am. Here I am. Is God going to communicate to you like that? And we're going to talk about that tonight because if you're waiting for God to communicate to you, I question your salvation. Ooh. I question your salvation. If you're waiting for God to communicate to you, if you're waiting for something from the outside to communicate to your inside. Because if you're born again, you already have them on the inside, and you've got to be developing your spirit. We talked last, night, last week about Galatians 5, 22 and 23, about the fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. With a big S, little s, it is little s there. And in the Greek, that pneuma, that spirit, that is all-encompassing. All so when they translated the Bible from Greek, it should have been Hebrew, and it ended up being translated, it didn't define if it was your spirit or God's spirit, so they put a big S there so they didn't want to offend the Holy Spirit. So that spirit, the fruits of the spirit, it starts off with love. The first one, if you love God, 
if you follow the fruits of the Spirit, it should reflect your position with God in each of those areas. So the fruits of the Spirit comes when you start operating in unison with the Holy Spirit. He's inside you. He starts building you up in these areas. And so the question about here I am, it's right here. It's already inside you. And we're going to go over that today because I believe this warfare we're going to go into uh, is going to be a, a, a revelation warfare. Um, in, when we, we go back to the Isaac and Abraham when he was talking about uh, the, the vision and the revelation, these are things that come to you not when God comes to you, but when you go to God in the spirit. You have a spirit man, and your spirit man should be operating in a realm between here and heaven. As we're praying in the spirit, we need to develop that spirit man and have discernment to understand what's going on. We see Simon the sorcerer in the book of Acts, and he wanted that spirit. He wanted that laying hands on, he wants to see that laying on the hands and, you know, there's... How do you get that? And this is the problem with the uh, charismatic movement and the spirit-filled movement. Everybody thinks there's a price there. We see that where people will pray for hours and hours and hours and hours, but they're not listening to God. They're telling God what to do, but their spirit is not listening to God. We have people that have pos position, positional Christianity. We have, like Kimberly was saying, denominational uh, five-fold ministry where they really aren't in that office. People just say, well, hey, oh, you're an evangelist. You dress like an evangelist. Look at that. You know, years ago, my uh, brother-in-law was bald, and he still is. <laughs> he doesn't grow back. <laughs> and he looked at my hair, and he goes, well, you look like a Pentecostal preacher. I didn't even know what a Pentecostal was back then. I go, really? I guess he was a prophet, too. And so... <laughs> It's a hair thing. The Spirit will release the truth if you let it. And we get in the teachings that will hinder people from development based on denominations, but it's also based on how you're being taught. Are you being taught in the Spirit? There's an impartation that's been going on in the Spirit here for a few, few, few months, and some of you, are, you guys are nodding your head yes, some of you don't know what I'm saying. We are, div we are fighting a spiritual battle, and we could call it, we have became a spiritual Israel. Israel here was not the country. This is the man, Israel. Jacob became Israel. There's a point in time where you have to step up into your position in the spirit and take dominion. First of all, the spirit said, do not be afraid. We're going to see that pattern over and over and over. In the New Testament, when it says, have faith in God, it is literally translated in Hebrew, have trust in God. Do you trust God? There's a trusting that has to go on that you have to develop between you and God. I can't put it in you. I can't teach you. I can show you examples of it, but until you experience it yourself, it's very hard for you to take that next step. And so we're trying to incorporate the spirit man, those things that needed to be, be developed in this next year for battle. This is all about battle. I saw this week that there, has anybody, anybody see the uh, fact that they're tearing up the Temple Mound right now? Oh. They're, they're, they, uh, I, I, just un I don't understand why Israel just doesn't take a, a stance on this because they're literally tearing up some of the, uh, the Temple Mound, the, the, the Muslims are. And these are actually areas where it's supposed to be Christian and Jewish shrines that are being destroyed. And actually it's where the original temple is supposed to be, right David? Alright. So we're going to get into about communication and revelation. Why is the revelation? Because revelation is the last book of the Bible. You know, it's funny because the Catholic Church calls it the... What do they call it? Apocrypha? No, no, that's, a, that's those ec extra books they make up. Uh, the apostasy. Huh? I don't know. I've never been there. I've never been to a Catholic church. They wouldn't let me in. <laughs> they wouldn't. I, I've been there. They, they, they wouldn't even do this to me. <laughs> and so the 
apostasies that are going on in the world is a revelation to the church. We're being disconnected individually, corporately, denominationally, and racially. We're being divided up in little pieces. And we've got to refuse this. And so, but we have to go back to our original spirit. And what does this have to do with Christmas? We're going to teach on Christmas. How many people want to hear about Christmas? We were teaching last week about how Hanukkah actually is a time that the Holy Spirit came to Mary. Praise God. So the Spirit came to Mary. There was a revelation there. But there's also a message here that we got to get out this week. In Luke chapter 1. Let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 11 through 13. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw him, and fear gripped him. Let's go to verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, Zacharias for your Petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name of John. Verse 14. And you will have joy and gladness and rejoice at his birth. There's a shifting there of the news that was coming. He had petitioned God. This is John the Baptist's father. I think he was a Southern Baptist. There's Southern Judea, Southern Baptist. And so this Baptist, the Spirit of God came in the form of an angel. God sent a messenger, an angel, to him. And he said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. This is before Christ died on the cross. So in the New Testament, we see angels coming for a reason. They come to communicate. So the angel was on the outside speaking to the man. We know the rest of the story. Let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to the God, was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, Miriam. And, a, and coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one this is the Lord with you and she was greatly troubled at the statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this must be and the angel said to her do not be afraid for you have found favor with God and behold you will conceive in your womb and bear a son you shall call him uh, Emmanuel he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high God and the Lord Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of uh, Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. How far was I going? Well, that's fine. So she spoke to the angel and said uh, to the angel, How can this be since I'm a virgin? It goes on, and the angel answered. He said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for this reason the, the holy offspring shall... Be called the Son of God, and behold, even your relatives Elizabeth has also conceived the Son in her old age, and she will, uh, who was called barren, is now uh, in her sixth month. Verse 37, for, for nothing will be impossible with God. Angel comes, she's in fear, comforts her with the communication. Holy Spirit comes to her, conceives Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua Mashiach. This fulfills the first prophecy of the Bible that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent. Yeah, that makes sense. Both of them are from the line of David. That's factual. That makes sense. But something happens here. There's a transition going on here. Now, if we were Catholic, I, I, saw, I saw a Christmas thing where Mary was like this giant over the city, you know. I, I don't think she ever did that. But Mary received the message and allowed the Spirit of God to move in her. That had to happen. Because the sin state that man was in, the Spirit of God could not move. Remember we became part of the Adams family? Remember the Adams family? We became a part of that. Our spirit was co conceived 
in perfection, complete shalom, nothing wrong, and through the flesh canal, we receive sin, the sin nature of Adam. So we had to receive through the virgin, a righteous person, someone right standing, clean, sinless, to receive the blood so the spirit of God could be reinstated into mankind. Praise God. We're going to take this a little bit further. So she, had, she was hearing that. So the Holy Spirit came upon her. And at this point, when the Holy Spirit came upon her, she trusted God. W would you say if she was the first one to be born again? I don't know. But I believe she understood the prophecies of the ancient days. She probably understood the prophecies of the Messiah coming, how it was going to be born of a virgin, of Bethlehem. All these things probably all were compiled in her at some point in time. She born, birthed Christ. Christ dies on the cross. So you can have that same spirit put in you that came through the Holy Spirit upon her. Upon her. Now why did the Holy Spirit send an angel to her in the first place? Because the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He cannot just come in. And, he couldn't just go, hey, I'm overshadowing you here. You know, it's not like... Uh, what's the, the, the Christmas story with Scrooge and all those guys? Huh? Yeah, there you go. Hey, so the Holy Spirit had to send an angel to make the offer. See what I'm saying? Mary could have refused because we're still dealing with free will. Mary had her spirit man in her heart and she had to open enough space so the Spirit of God could come to her. So she had to receive the Holy Spirit. So is this complex? I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. Doing okay? Thank you. I get the, the thumbs up and go. So all of a sudden, we go from having in the Gospels the Spirit of God coming to the outside, speaking to people, to the point where it could start speaking directly to people's hearts. Heart to heart. Christ dies on the cross. What happens? He sends us the helper. The helper comes. He comes inside you. That spirit of God is inside you now. This is the battle right now we're dealing with. This is the battle of religious people about the spirit of God. You are born again. This is your spirit, man. And whatever is inside your heart is either allowing the spirit to move or blocking the spirit. And so you have to decide which side of the fence you're going to be on. You have life. Yes, you're a born again. You've got the Spirit of God in you, but you need to let Him out once in a while. Because He has a mission for you. So the gifts of the Spirit are a reflection of how you're interacting with God on the inside. How you're acting with God on the, in, in your inner man. And we're going to walk through some of the inner man steps. Let's go to John 3.16. How many people have ever heard this one? I got I got to watch the time, but there's so much here. I want to unload on you, and every every January we start with the uh, uh, Kenneth Hagen's book, Believer's Authority. This is where the rubber meets the road. If you don't understand how the Holy Spirit is positioned in your heart through your salvation and the and the leverage you have because you have accepted Christ and the power of God's in you needs to be released not through him doing something but through you doing something. So the gifts of the Spirit are love. And we see this, the first thing that God gives us in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have eternal life. So the love factor in you is not how much I love you guys. I'm not Mother, Mother Teresa. You know, I am not Mother Teresa. Do I look like Mother Teresa? I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not. <laughs> she loved everybody, but people question her salvation. You can love the world and lose God. How much love do you have for God? And this is when, when Jesus was talking about keep my commandments. There are certain things we have to abstain from. Pork. I don't know. We, we, all, we talked about this earlier. Everybody has their own different levels. Cookies. 
There's things that we have to save them from. Let me put it this way. This is a real simple litmus test. If it's blocking you from God, you need to quit. Pretty simple. Some people, it's a problem. I, t- I spoke, uh, spoke to a young man today who, uh, uh, you know Steve that used to helps with the camera? He went to Germany, got a job, went to Germany as a programmer. First of all, they found out he has a German last name. Oh, your name is Schlarman. You need another N on it. And by the way, we drink beer all the time. They're in Germany. Right? And he figured out that his German gene kicked in. His German drinking beer gene kicked in. And so he's drinking beer and eating pretzels for breakfast. And then he realized that his German gene kept him from getting drunk. That's what he thought. But see, that's how we are. We think that if, if we're in, our, in the midst of our folks, we can backslide, we can do these things, or we have to act a certain way. That's why I like Yeshua House. We have so many different variations and nationalities and different backgrounds. God's keeping us all honest. He went over there and he actually grew a beard. A little baby face that received grew a beard. No, oh, he looks like old drunk German. <laughs> That's what happens to the world. We get Christ in us. We get this great experience. And then all of a sudden we go out and we try to witness to the world. And we fall right back in that trap. So this year we have to plan ahead. We need to start planning ahead in the spirit. And we have to pray in the spirit that the spirit leads us. And the Spirit knows that we're brothers because of the love we want we have one for one another. That we know, He knows that He can trust us. So those things that have to be built up in this season will have to be in the Spirit. And so God gave, love, love the world. He gave His only Son. We have to love God to understand that He's trying to save the world again. He did not mess this place up. And when you blame God for stuff, that's your problem. You're cutting all the blessings off, God. How many times I talk, well, you know, God doesn't do the blah, 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 blah. It's like, you know what? I just want to smack you. That is not from God. There's no faith there. You're putting conditions on God in your world, in your flesh world. And we have to learn to release the spirit, man, or come in agreement in the spirit with the Holy Spirit that's inside us and start acting like it. Amen. So let's go to Ephesians 3.16. Ephesians 3.16, we come across some really good stuff here. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to his riches of his glory and to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. He is already there 100%, but there has to be a transference of power to your man. There has to be a shifting there, and it has to be you that surrenders whatever you have that's blocking it. That shifting comes when you start agreeing with God, when you start reading your Bible right, and when you start uh, showing a little fortitude there, when you give up those things that you know you're in sin in. We started preaching against certain things last year, about uh, righteousness, and guess what? We had some people leave the church. And they thought I was talking to them. Everybody has different sin issues. So he wants to transfer that power that he gave you through his spirit into your inner man. So he's in there, he's a seed. He's a seed. And we're here. At some point in time, you want, the, you want your spirit man to encapsulate him. Encapsulate. To cover. So everything that you have is surrounded, is surrounding God's spirit. Your spirit, his spirit. And you start understanding when you're, commuting in the, you're communicating in the spirit. I, had, I got this uh, uh, young lady, her, her mom's a pastor... Well, how do you know it's, it's your spirit, God's spirit? I said, usually it's because God will speak to you, tell you something you don't want to do, and that's something you'd never think about. Is that true? Because if it was something that you could do, and you're thinking about, 
It's probably your soul. So we have to go from being a soul-minded being, allowing our emotions to control our spirit, man. No, we're created spirit, mind, and body, and we need to control it that way because the battle that's coming up is not about what you look like on the outside. It's about how you take that Holy Spirit that's in you, walk with Him, talk with Him, dance with Him, release Him. Now, we were in worship, and I was praying, I don't know, God, breathe on them. Did you hear me say that? I didn't say that, but I was praying in the Spirit. I saw you in the Spirit. And so he needs to release that breath. And there's always this renewing. There's a daily renewing of the Spirit. It's a relationship. You have to have that constant love showing the Spirit of God. First of all, you have to love your life. Most people live their lives for other people, and that's wrong. You've got to love the fact that God created you uniquely. You know, Kimberly uses that expression, that God loves us equally. No, he doesn't. He loves you uniquely. Because if that was true, how could he hate Esau and love Jacob? As you love God, he reciprocates more love, vice, vice versa. If you distance yourself from God... He will distance himself through you because he's a gentleman. Certain things he cannot tolerate, even though you're born again. If you're in sin, he has to step away from you. So it goes from his perfect love to his permissible love to unpermitted. Most of the church is in this permissible love, this being permitted, and he's closing his eyes. It's like, no, don't go too far. You can fall off the end. Because once you go too far, he cannot protect you. His spirit is talking to your spirit through what? His word and his covenant. He sent his angels, say, I am here, don't be afraid, and this is the covenant. When you get those two things together, you'll start understanding your authority. First of all, you'll understand the value of your salvation. That's what we've been teaching for months and months and months. How valuable, how powerful, how much you need to understand your salvation. Your f base factor of everything you have in your religious experience, throw that word religion out, your relationship or experience with God is understanding your salvation, how much real power there is. You could be named Rockefeller and be dirt poor unless you know how to go press that ATM button. All right? Until you know how to write that check. Until you know how to go in boldly and ask the Father, hey, I'm a Rockefeller, I want that. Now, we don't talk about the Rockefellers over here because we know they're a part of the Immunati. And <laughs> they're bad, bad. But they got all the money. And we know who their father is. Amen. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John. Chapter 4, verse 4. Oh, how many people have heard this? You are from God. Let me do my Captain Kirk. You are from God. Little children, and overcome them, because greater is he is in you than who is in the world. We hear that so many times, but we don't know how to position that in our personal lives. We have leverage. Whatever's going on on the outside, you already have the victory. Well, it doesn't look like I have the victory. Don't look. It doesn't sound like I have the victory. Well, don't listen. Those things were put in you, that power of God was put in you, so you can become an overcomer. To the end. Now, uh, how many people have had a perfect life here? Oh, okay. <laughs> Everything's going good, smash, bang, crash, boom, every big old problem. <laughs> I'm not talking about you. But there's a point where you have to realize there's a purpose for that. Because you have insurance. Amen. <laughs> We have insurance. And that insurance is paid for in full. Now, was it the driver's fault? 
Or was it somebody else's accident? It could be either way. But the steps to recovery are always the same. And if you get into bitterness about something, God can't use you because all of a sudden you got this bitter root in there. He's like, oh, God, I hate that. Hey, he, can't, he can't move you along and get you to the place of healing. Or you don't want to forgive yourself. Wow, look what I did. Or, you know, or you want something extra. You want payback. Right? I want payback. So there's a point where you have to understand your salvation is a process to maintain you in this planet, on this earth, as long as you're alive, and you really don't have the right to go beyond what he promises. First of all, why would you want to go beyond what he promises? Because if you go beyond what he promises, then you're into coveting. Ooh, you're taking contracts, you're breaking contracts. You go beyond the covenant. So if you say within the covenant, well, we're not under the law. That's the law of sin. There is, there's parameters he's given us in the Bible, how to act, talk, and walk, to maintain and control the flesh, so our spirit maintains its relationship with the Holy Spirit, so we can walk with the Holy Spirit, and we can grow and prosper. So when we do pray the prayer, Jabez, our tents will expand. Those things will increase. He trusts you more so you can have more. If you want to get in the game playing, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, there's no guarantee that's going to happen. But if you're walking with faith within his parameters, so when Jacob, Israel, came to the place of his father, he made covenant, he stood in that covenant, went to the altar, and recognized what? Salvation. Jacob went to the point of covenant between Abraham and God and Isaac that there was a covenant of salvation there. Is that true? Covenant of salvation. That's what this whole thing's about. Abraham was going to sacrifice his son so God would sacrifice his son. It's a place of salvation. So when you start operating in that place of salvation, understanding how strong your salvation is, your purpose and your covenant, you get your breakthrough. I was praying one day for uh, Josh's wife. She came up to me in the spirit. The Lord told me to remind her. This lady was arrested in Turkey. She was a missionary in Turkey. You guys think you got a bad? Go to a Muslim country and try to be a missionary. And I prayed and the Lord showed me how deep she had to get into her spirit and understand her salvation so the Holy Spirit was released. We almost all fell out. We don't have challenges here. We keep pushing off, complaining about the little things. Well, I don't like that. I don't like this. Do something. <laughs> so he is in you is greater than what's in the world. Uh, maybe you've got a bigger purpose than what you see. Or, but the only way you're going to get it if you learn how to act that way. You can't be royalty if you act like a peasant, a pauper. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4.16. We're going we're gonna to nail this down tonight. You know, we've been talking about being spirit-filled, being spirit-led. I even got a word from Michael tonight. Lonnie released something over you in prayer, Mr. Hood. And you've been searching for it, and it's going to be released. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16. Therefore, do not lose heart, but through the outer man, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Verse 17. For momentarily light affliction. Oh, that didn't even hurt. It's like a Monty Python moment. Light affliction is produce, <laughs> producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Whatever's happening to you now is nothing. You got to put a little weight on the bar to build up. The challenge hasn't even hit yet. 
And the church is not ready. And we're going to get Yeshua House and all the ministers here. All you folks are getting trained up in the spirit because there's going to be a battle going on. And it's going to be a choice of good and evil. It's going to be your spirit choosing the spirit of the world or the spirit that's inside you. God looks where? He looks at the inner man. He's looking at the inner man. He sees the outside. Kimberly asked me, what did you ask me yesterday? Why do we have to get old? I don't know, after all we ate yesterday? <laughs> How many people aren't getting old in here? All right. I think there's a point in time where you're old enough, but you're not dead. <laughs> and you realize, I got to do something now because I got to fix a lot of things around me. And there's some people that hang on to bitter roots and they're not receiving the message. I'm not speaking about people in here tonight. But we have to take this message, we have to communicate to ourselves from spirit man to God. Each of you have a plan God is lining up for you now. I'm starting to sound like uh, Joel Olstein. Um, first, first Samuel, sixteen, and here's another. Here's an example of this. Here, this is the Old Testament example where God, people were looking at uh, David, and God came to choose a king. Verse Samuel, verse seven. But the Lord said to Samuel, "Do not look at his appearance, or at the height of his stature, because I." Have because I have rejected him, for God sees not as a man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I personally do a lot of heart cleaning. When I first got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I was reading uh, the book, Prayers of Availeth Much, and, I, I was, I, and, and it says, I cried, Abba, Father, and I got back on my shika, and I started praying in tongues. Praise God. I didn't, know, I didn't know anything about praying in tongues. I got baptized Holy Ghost sitting in my house in uh, Scottsdale. And then I couldn't pray in tongues. And so I get in my car and I didn't know what to do. And so one day the la this lady said, every time you get in your car, pray in tongues. I didn't know how, well, I couldn't pray in tongues. Sometimes I could pray in tongues, sometimes I couldn't. I was going through a rough time. So I recited Psalms 51. Clean in me a clean heart, O Lord. Clean in me, a, making me a clean heart, O Lord. And so I went through this cleaning process, and one day I was completely beat up, and I jump in my car, and every time I got in my car, so I was praying in tongues. So this one day I was completely knocked knocked down. I jump in my car and I forgot to pray. And I just turned the ignition on. I went, no, 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 no. It just started coming out. <laughs> just, it's, I just started the car and boom, it just came out spontaneously. And so there's a point why we need to pray in the Spirit. And if you don't understand why we pray in the Spirit, I pray in the Spirit more than y'all. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 14, 14. We have to pray in the Spirit because it edifies you it trains your spirit, man. It explains the mysteries that we're dealing with. So God's looking at your heart, which is the spirit man. Your spirit man. And we deal with people a lot of times. They look okay on the outside, but they're tweaky on the inside. You know what tweaky? Tweaky. There's something not right. They're fake, they're phony, they're covering up something, they're covering up sin. And it's usually, usually uh, shows up at one point or another. So you want to keep your heart clean because as you're dealing with the Holy Spirit, you can see it. And especially if you're in the Spirit and you've got some intercessors over here, as you're praying in the Spirit, you start seeing people of who they are in the Spirit. And they may sound very bold, or have a great preaching ability. I remember years ago, I was invited to a conference. I was driving uh, back in 1996. I was driving. I was in Roanoke, Virginia. And I was praying in the Spirit. And I, and I was up at Prayer Mountain. And how many people have ever been to a black church? 
All right. I didn't preach in a white church for like the first 10 years of my ministry. And so I got kidnapped by a church in God in Christ. Is that who they are? Church in God in Christ? Well, I'll tell you what. I got in there, and back then I had a tan. <laughs> I got into this church, and they wanted me to judge this preaching. They have competitions about preaching. And these guys were hooping. How many people know what hooping is? Hooping! And I am surprised they didn't short out the microphone. And they're hooping and spitting and jumping and kicking. And the way it all started off, they, they called all the men up front. Okay, you want to hear something funny? Well, I'm a man. I'll go up there. And I, I'm the only white guy in probably about 2,000 people. And I, I had jeans on and a polo shirt. And they, they brought all the men up front and they said, okay, we're going to do a praise dance. And all of a sudden they go, bump, 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 bump. <laughs> and so all I could think of about was uh, Charlie Brown and, you know, the Snoopy, you know, when they dance like this. <laughs> and so, Shoes are flying. I was hanging in there. But I was thinking about that this morning when I was praying for the sermon because these guys were, are they preaching in the spirit or are they preaching out of their soul? It sure does sound good, but what spirit is behind it? What's the intention? To draw attention to themselves or attention to him? So we have to put the Spirit first in all things in this time. Otherwise, we get lost. Why do we get lost? Let's go to the next verse. Let's go to Psalm or uh, Proverbs 20, verse 27. We've used this proverb before. It's just a basic proverb. But it, it guides you to a point where you understand who, what God is looking for. In Proverbs 20, verse 27, The Spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. Searching all the innermost parts of his being. Your spirit is inside you, kind of lost, but God is comparing it to his spirit inside you. There's a comparison going on. God wants his spirit to be reflected in your spirit, but he also wants you to yield to his spirit. As we yield in the spirit we start seeing those fruits of the Spirit. It was says, out of a man's mouth comes issues of the heart. So when people say, well, I don't know if I'm going to get healed, or I, can't, I don't have faith for this, or whatever, there has to be a transition. You have to get away from that, as Brother Hagin would say, sinking thinking. Let's go back to Colossians. We can just do Colossians 13.10. We're, we're getting tied up for time. There has to be a renewing of the Spirit so God's righteousness can be demonstrated in your life. Uh, Colossians 3.10 The renewing of your spirit, man, has to happen so people can see the righteousness of God. Not a self-righteousness. You know, not like that. But the righteousness of God, where there's a reflection of Him in you to the world. The righteousness is so God can see Christ in us, so the world can compare who we are compared to what the Word says. We need that comparison. We're not supposed to compare ourselves to each other, but we need to compare ourselves to the, the Spirit of God in the world. Uh, Second Corinthians 5.21. Something happens here as you accept Christ in your life. This is a good teaching, guys. I'm, I'm, getting it, I'm, I'm hammering it down in you. Because it's supposed to last all year. Second Corinthians 5.21. He, he made him who knew no sin... To be sin on our behalf that we might become righteousness of God in him. Christ died for you so you can stop sinning. You're not in sin anymore. You're not under the law of sin. You stop sinning, acting, talking that way. And you start developing your spirit man so people know that he is in you. The power of God's in you. 
So you can start releasing that, first of all, by self-control. Get your act straight. Grow up a little. And we have a body of Christ. It's a bunch of baby Christians, and they don't want to deal with issues. And they got a lot of sin issues, root issues, soul ties. That kind of garbage needs to be cut off and thrown out. Ephesians 4, 23 through 24. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, has been created in the righteousness and the holiness of truth. Once you start praying in the Spirit, you start understanding the truth, really, about what? You, about yourself, about what God's plan is, how people are really treating you. You start seeing the world through the Father's eyes. You start realizing, hey, some of the stuff I'm doing is not right. Your priorities change. Your relationships change. Well, I got saved and I lost all my friends. Good. You didn't need them. They weren't your friends. They hate God. They're God haters. My parents, my people don't understand me. Oh, you're the black sheep of the family. Hallelujah. Praise God. Bring them on in. Pray for them. But the power of God is going to start getting released here because we're understanding this. But we're a new creation and the holiness and the truth because here I am, now he's here I am. Here I am. He's inside you. You can't go back. The power of God's inside you. There's a release of the Spirit as we're talking right now. Let's go to Hebrews 4.16. Why is this important? We'll find out. Is Hebrews, we call that the book of the Jews? They don't have that. Hebrews 4.16. There's alignment going on. has been going on for about, since we were in worship. God wants something breakthrough this year. Breakthrough for Yeshua House, corporately, individually. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confessions. Why is this? He wants us to recognize him first because he makes the way so we can go boldly before the throne. People, we, we, we pray in the spirit. We take people up to the throne room. I have people that have that Simon the sorcerer spirit. They're trying to do something in the spirit. They're trying to get something out of the spirit. And they're in witchcraft. We see that a lot when we go to Korea because they're shamans. And we have shamans in the church. And they don't have the righteousness of Christ in them and they don't know how to follow the Spirit of God. So what they're doing, they're trying to rob God. Tinas always talks about that, people robbing God. They come to church and they, they just want to take something away but they don't want to contribute. That's robbing God. They don't want to pray for anybody. They always want somebody else to pray for them. That's robbing God. We go boldly before the throne because we know we're in right standing with him. We've accepted everything he has. We're following what he says and he, we're following the plan he has for our lives so we can grow and be bold and do those things he wants us to do. I believe the direction of what's going to happen in Yeshua house is going to expand because not only it's a, it's a spirit thing going on right now, but we're committed in the spirit. We're warriors. This is spirit battle. And there's a lot of technical things that we do understand. We study these things. But if it starts blocking the spirit and our knowledge is greater than our spirit, nah. If we, get in, we, we can get in some messianic legalisms and not say this and we can't say Jesus, but no, 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 you know what? I, 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 I deal with nuts and flakes all day long. And that religious spirit has to be broken and it, has, it cannot be the letter of the law. It has to be the spirit. There are some people that are weak and been broken and we have to give them space. Seriously. There's some people that are on the recovery track. We need to give them a helping hand. 
And there's some of you that need to grow up, suck it up, and move forward. Seriously. (laughs) When this happens, that's when the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the supernatural meets the natural. This is when we're going to have an explosion. This is when that revival comes. When you can say, hey, you know what? You're sick. Come in here. You need to get saved first. You need to, you need to meet somebody that will fix that. We started Yeshua House on Friday nights as a Shabbat ministry because too many people were hurt and injured from gun, Sunday church. But they'll come in here and listen to me talk, preach, lay hands. We're getting to the point where our foundation is growing and the Word of God, the wisdom of God, those things that we've been trained in is being imparted to you. Father, we ask for that impartation tonight that we are coming boldly before you tonight, not for a New Year's resolution, but for a life resolution. That we have breakthroughs over our lives, over our hearts, our spirit, our mind, our bodies, our families, our finances, our health, Hashem, in the mighty name of Yeshua, let these things happen today because we are your children and that you loved us and we love you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Praise God. I'm excited.